Rio Cragen, welcome to the pod, man. How's it going? Thank you for being on. Let's go. No, I'm excited, man. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to have you part of season six. Um, you have a cool drop coming up with sound um, and a bunch of other cool things that you've been working on in crypto. So what better time to just highlight them than now? But before we get into all that cool shit that you're doing, I want to start with a quick introduction. Who are you for those who aren't familiar with you? Uh, but more specifically, how did you get your start into crypto? Yeah, um, I'm an artist uh, first and uh, foremost, honestly. Yeah, so I come from Vancouver, Washington, which is uh, this small city in the top left corner of the United States. Uh, it's right next to Portland, Oregon. And, um, you know, I was going to school full time. Uh, I was on a full ride scholarship uh, to Washington State University. And out of the blue, one day I just decided that school wasn't for me and I was just going to go pursue music. So I left to Los Angeles with like pretty much zero money in my pocket and just like did the classic couch surfing move and just prayed that everything would work out. <laughs> and uh, that's really how I got my start in music. Um, couch surf for like a year uh, and had a song that just caught. And that's kind of what was a catalyst for my entire music career what was the first couch you slept on remember first <laughs> the couch first you surfed couch yeah was was my manager's yeah for okay. sure so i had met my manager in uh, uh in portland oregon i was i used to write like hooks for other artists and whatnot so there were these like portland artists that i was writing some hooks for uh super talented dudes and um yeah, and he was managing them at the time or consulting for them. Uh, I, I don't know which was the correct answer, but he was <laughs> doing that. <laughs> and that's how I ended up meeting him. And uh, yeah, couch surfed on, on his house in, in, in Los Angeles. <laughs> okay, so how many, how many couches did you actually end up surfing? I know oh, it's, it's, it might be a weird question, but it, it's actually quite fascinating to kind of like just like yeah. on on like peel peel the hustle you know <laughs> <laughs> quite a bit honestly like um uh the two uh the two long term stays that i had for sure were uh for, with my brother jeremy tyler okay. he's like a professional basketball player i met him super randomly um and like we just became really good friends super quick and he was like dude i got a room for you and uh yeah so shout out to jeremy because definitely changed my life <laughs> yeah. wild wild yeah. it's uh it's like when you look back like everything just sort of makes sense when you sort of piece right. all the dots together but in the moment when you kind of got to your manager's house that first night on that first uh, on that on the first couch that you surfed right i wonder i wonder what was going through your head uh, at that time do you, do you remember like what you were feeling like just I moved new city all this stuff yeah, I was terrified. <laughs> I, was, I was completely terrified. I was like, oh, geez, did I make the right decision? You know, like I had everything, you know, I had stability. You know, I had a car. I had a nice job. I had a full ride scholarship. And then to kind of give all of that up um, in the blink of an eye to going towards uncertainty and just like uncharted territory. Because like no one that I had ever known, you know, had like. Right made a successful career off of music or anything like that so i was just completely in the dark and i was terrified <laughs> for sure so where where did that courage and that will sort of come from um i think um it came from a place of me just being unhappy and unsatisfied with like where i was at at that time in life uh i was just school came really easy to me and mm. i thought just because something came easy to me like doesn't mean that this is my calling and i always felt like it wasn't my calling in the, the direction that i was heading so yeah i i wanted to be more creative and um and that's why i chose music what did you actually attempt to major in before you dropped out yeah so i was studying medicine and, and business mm -hmm. and i was it was interesting because my school had this program where I think like a few kids were able to go to college uh, as soon as we turned 16. So I had already like had two years of college under my belt by the time oh, I was wow. 18. Um, and when I was 19, then I go to Washington State on this full ride. And, you know, pretty much like after three years of school, I was like, uh, I'm out of here, even though I only have one year to go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so but. what what did your parents think when you dropped out? 
my mom was concerned for sure. <laughs> she was just like mainly concerned if I was eating or not. But, right. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, she she was super supportive the whole time. Uh, they didn't know if it was gonna work out or whatever, but sure. they always believed in me for sure. Yeah. yeah, I think I think it's all always that that uh that assumption. When I was in college, I had a couple of friends that also dropped out, and it was always one of those things like, okay, whatever you go and attempt to do doesn't work out, you can always go back to school. Like, so there's true. always that option, but you only have so many opportunities that sort of kind of present themselves to you at a certain given time, and uh, if you don't take them, you miss them. So true. At such a pivotal point in life, too. Like that 18, 19, 20. Right. You know, like you still got a whole bunch of drive and ambition and whatnot. And uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just so interesting. Crazy. Yeah. So so when did crypto come into the picture? Yep. So um, definitely came into the picture during the pandemic. Okay. Um, like many I, people, by the way. A lot right. of people kind of came into it. Yeah. For sure, I was late to the party. Um, I had a whole friend. I had a whole bunch of friends in it um, from like 2016, 2017. Okay, uh, that run, and um, and I was sitting it out because I was like in the ma- middle of like touring cycle and um, album cycle, so I didn't have like a lot of time or bandwidth to um, to do a whole bunch of research on my own. Uh, you know, like they were, you know making money or whatever at that time but (laughs) that doesn't justify me like putting sure you know my money into into somewhere uh i need to like know what's going on i need to understand how things work and so during the pandemic i had a whole bunch of time to just like do a whole bunch of research and figure out what what everything was um and that's where i like literally just fell in love with the whole ecosystem yeah so when you when you jumped into Web3, as people like to use the phrase, yeah. what were some of the initial resources you, you might have kind of like latched on in the beginning? Like, did you listen to podcasts? Did you read blogs? Did you talk to friends? Did you open a MetaMask right away and try to buy shit? Like, what, was your, what, what were some of the steps you took in the beginning? Yeah, so the first, the first step was, uh, I guess, the conversion from a whole bunch of my friends just being like, yo, okay. you got to check this out. You got to check this out. Uh, and so that was the first step. Uh, the second was definitely YouTube. I, I watched so much YouTube. It was ridiculous. <laughs> like, like a thousand hours probably in like the course of a few months. Um, and, um, yeah, that was, that was mainly, okay. that was mainly it. And then after that is when I really got heavily into seeing what was going on on Twitter. Uh, and so, I realized that content comes super streamlined fast on Twitter for like crypto related right. things. And so that's where I was at a lot of the time as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's a reason why they call it crypto Twitter. Like every, everything yeah. <laughs> lives on, on Twitter. And uh, if you're not in Twitter, are you even in crypto? Right. right. Like that's how, that's how I like to think about it. Um, and, and it's funny that you, you said that you came in late. Um, do you still think you, you came in late despite all the sort of like exposure you've gotten, the drops you've had, the collectors you've built, like, are you still in that, that not regretful mindset, but like the belief that you came in super late? No, I honestly, I don't. I think that it's still extremely early personally. Um, I think that I came in late, like to, um, when it comes to like, even knowing what like a blockchain is pretty much Mm. (laughs) like that is that's where i feel like i was late as far as like the knowledge i think that the ecosystem is still early um where there's still like the beginning stages in some of these protocols and whatnot and and just like the possibilities of where things can go uh with the technology for sure how would you explain the current state of where we are in music today and where music intersects with crypto oh geez man this is extremely still at the beginning <laughs> in okay. my opinion yeah why sure. is that um so okay so last year um geez i would say probably around this time last year in like september um i saw everything that was I've, i had been paying attention to everything that was going on in nfts and whatnot and the pfp culture and i was like oh shoot this is kind of wild this is cool seeing everyone rallying and whatnot and it's like everyone's excited uh and i was just a little confused i was like 
where where does the music exist in this? Uh, because there's like definitely a use case for it. And um, so during that time, I was like seeking out people who were releasing on chain and um, just like seeing people who were experimenting and from, you know, trying to connect the dots is where I initially linked with uh, David Greenstein from Sound, one of the co-founders of Sound. And um, he told me about this idea that he was, uh, you know, like going to launch and whatnot and how he sees like the future of music. Um, and I was like, this is so sick. This is everything that I've been looking for, <laughs> you know, and like, really? For. Uh, and so, yeah. And so that was like the inception of sound. And then for the next few months, um, you know, there was a few artists like in these calls, like trying to, um, you know, just like offer, um, it was like the UX experience, you know, like, um, yeah. And I, I got like a bird's eye view into that and it yeah. was a really cool opportunity. Um, but yeah, but that to go back to why I think it's still early. Um, that was like, I think sound had launched probably in November of last mm -hmm. year. And we were like, Oh shoot. I wonder where it's going to be in six months. And like to see all the growth that's happened in right. this such amount of like short amount of time is just so insane. That's why I think it's extremely <laughs> early on the music side. It's yeah. like, you know, who knows the ecosystem could be completely different uh, a year from now. I collect a bunch of music NFTs. Um, and admittedly, when David come and, came and approached me with sound, um, I was an artist, right? I have a drum set behind me, so I'm a drummer. And yep. I never, I've, I've never really experienced the artist to fan relationship, right? I always just played amateurly and the concept, I, I saw like people do music NFTs. And when David came to me and told me about sound, I thought it was a really cool concept, but I had to, I had to like see it like visually to understand it. Right. right? Whereas you, you were like, you just told me, you were like, wow, this is everything that I've been looking for. I'm curious, like what, what initially resonated because it extends beyond just minting, right? these platforms, they allow, they allow the artists and the fan to come closer together. Right. Yep. Is that what resonated with you or what sort of stuck with you around this whole entire ethos, uh, ethos around music NFTs? Completely. Yeah. Um, so for example, um, generally like traditional music has been like artists and then top down. So, mm -hmm. so like, for example, uh, if I put out music on Spotify, um, and it streams very well and there's listenership all around the world. The bummer is I don't own any of that data. I don't, I, it's not mine, even though like it's the, my music and I put it out. I have no idea in relation, like really where these people are listening or who are my biggest supporters. Like I can't pick out Henry from New Jersey, you know what I right. mean? And you know, send him a poster or anything uh, as a, like a token of my appreciation or like take somebody out to lunch type, <laughs> type B, <beat>, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah. So that's like, that was always like a problem for me. Um, and uh, the thesis that, you know, instead of top down, it's like artist center and then spread out this way sure. to where you can have a more direct connection with a, listeners collectors supporters you know of all kinds and whatnot that yeah. was really what resonated with me and i guess like the future um of how things could be for sure yeah it's cool that you bring up the data component and you also bring up the uh the sort of like the the horizontal approach to kind of like growing a fan base and growing a community uh because that's like what web3 is good at like there, yeah. there are no borders in Web three in crypto. When you when you mint a token on chain and somebody collects that token, like Ethereum will never shadow ban you, right? You have all that information, and when products get kind of like created, they build around the creators, right? They they build around the artists. Whereas in in traditional social media or traditional platforms, it's very much like creators building audiences on the platform, right? And yep. um, you're also very limited with the type of information and value you can kind of capture on those platforms. Whereas in Web3, right, you sort of own, quote unquote, your community. Um, and that's sort of measured by the tokens that they hold and the experiences that you can kind of cultivate with that. 
I'm, yeah. I'm also like, I'm also fascinated that you brought up data because I'm curious, how do you use data in like web two sense? Like, so you couldn't get uh, Henry from New Jersey, right? But yeah. how would you typically use data as a, as an artist, either on Spotify, on Instagram or whatever other platforms you sort of uh, build an audience on? Yeah. So one of the easiest ways to use data is like, I know that I have 30,000, you know, fans in Australia that stream sure. my music every single month, you know? So, uh, so I know that I can go, you know, play a headline show out in Sydney. I can go play a headline show out in Melbourne, uh, in Perth, and I can go to Los Angeles. And that data tells me pretty much like, it gives me a rough estimate of ticket sales as well. Like mm -hmm. how much we could probably do. Um, that's like one of the general use cases of like the data. Got it. Not. Got but it. you know, that's, that's for like selling tickets, you know, and like things that, <clears throat> that like generate revenue and things of that nature. It's not like, like I said, like personable though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, I wish, I wish I had more information because like there are a lot of instances where I would love to like, you know, figure out a way to give back or else like go, I, if I see a whole bunch of people live in like a community that like listen to my music, I can go throw a pizza party or something like that, do a meet and greet and like, you know, hang out with people. Uh, so yeah, for sure. I would like Interesting. more ways of connecting with people uh, in, in, in that fashion rather than and just going to, you know, knowing that I can go play. The right. Show so on that same thought, I'm curious if you figured out how Web3 changes that and how issuing NFTs and building a collector base changes that. Have you sort of untapped and like uncovered that secret? Any any uh, insights over there? Because it's so early, no. Um, I have like an idea of like where it can get to. Um, okay. But all of that needs like, we need scalability for sure in order to get to those points. Um, and I think as it scales, for sure, I think it will be much easier. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So walk me through more of your drop history in, in crypto, um, because you were a part of the first cohort of sound. I remember that vividly. Yep. Um, I think I also collected, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know if it was, was it at the time? I can't remember. I think it was at the time. Um, because didn't you also have a, the, the song that you minted on sound, you then later released on traditional platforms, right? That, right so or was it was, or was it the other way around yeah it was it was my second song that i had minted on sound uh i ended up releasing traditionally yeah that's right and i remember vividly actually because i referenced this example on the podcast a few times where that sound drop didn't sell out fully but the second you announced that um or no it did sell out fully but it had a lower secondary floor and the second yep. you announced that it got like hundreds of thousands of, of listeners the floor automatically bumped up. And I remember I saw that crazy. tweet. Yeah, I, I I remember I saw that tweet and it was it, it was like a minute, posted a minute ago. And I was like, all right, I'm buying. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> this is an experiment. I bought it and the floor jumped, right? Yeah. And I thought and I thought that was such a such a cool, like interesting sort of take and seeing how, how web two kind of created the virality, but you were able to capture the value in web three, right? Yep. Walk, walk sure. me through that moment. Am I getting this correctly? <laughs> yeah, you're getting it, yeah, extremely correctly. Yeah, that was that was wild. So, so I had I th that was the second song that I minted on Sound. Um, we put it up. It was fifty editions at point one ETH. So, and it sold out like instantly. So it was like I think five ETH in primary value, um, and and it did like some secondary numbers. But I just love the song so much that I was like, Yo, I'm releasing an album. I want this <laughs> to be one of the singles. And then I got my homie kid ink on it and we we ended up putting it out and it did really well and um so i was like i made that tweet and then just like yeah like you said secondary just started going crazy and i was like that was not my goal like i was just <laughs> trying to be like look crazy at what, look at like the power of like you know web3 pretty much um and like we kind of all did this together um and then yeah it just started going crazy which was unexpected wow uh, and definitely like i said not my goal <laughs> and what a what a what a cool example to sort of reference when you talk about how both worlds connect right and yeah. seeing how artists are building communities and using crypto primitives but also still relying 
on traditional means of distribution through Spotify, Apple Music, etc. Like there's world, there's a world for both, right? And they actually maybe even now work in tandem somehow, right? And I think I think as as more as more listeners become collectors, that bridge is going to kind of like tighten, right? And it's going to become stronger. Um, but right now it's a little bit dispersed because not every listener is a is a collector, but every collector is a listener. So true. <laughs> so true. Yeah, I think you know it just it takes time. Uh, you know, like in a lot of traditional fans just still don't understand the concept of music NFTs currently, uh, or just digital collectibles in general. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I think that just takes a little bit of time and a little bit of education. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, soon come, for sure. Soon, <laughs> soon, 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 soon. TBD. Um, on that, on that note, because we're already talking about drops, we're talking about sound. Um, you have a new drop coming out, right? Yep. Um, walk me through it, because it's uh, it was also at the same time where Sound announced its protocol, and it ended up being one of the largest drops next to Daniel Allen that I saw kind of like come out during the bear market too, right? Yep. So, so walk me through it. What are you doing? What's so unique about it? Um, and yeah, curious to learn more. Yeah, Sound Protocol. It's um it's the first project that's uh going to be incorporating the use of Sound Protocol. Um cool. which I'm super excited about. Um you know, from the beginning, um I'm an artist who makes a whole bunch of music, man. Like I just I crank out music. Uh and I kind of always have. And because of that, like I like putting projects out. Um it's really fun to put singles out, don't get me wrong, but the cool thing about web three is like, I have a new way to express like my creativity. And so doing a project, you can express a little bit more of like the creative side. And so with this project, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, it's called frameworks. Like we worked on the pieces for like months. <laughs> my, uh, uh, a friend of mine created like these 2d digital assets and then, uh, everlasting who like i work closely with like turn them into um 3d um digital assets which is so sick and then we spent a lot of time on this music uh and we wanted to put it out in a really meaningful way and um yeah and i'm, I'm super excited about it uh we think that's it's wild yeah. yeah go ahead go ahead yeah uh, i i'm calling it frameworks because i think this is like the frameworks of like how i'm going to be moving forward uh, okay. This is like the building block of like kind of the next era. Um, and it's the first project on sound protocol. So it's like, okay, cool. This is, this is square one. This is how we are, are moving from here on out. And what's cool about this drop is that it's, it's five songs in one, right? Yeah. And it, but it's not the first time you've dropped five tracks at a time. I remember there was a, there was a, a, a previous release, maybe I think it was a year or so back and, and fill in the gaps of where I'm blanking out. But, you sort of had this model where you dropped five songs. You did this entire like PR thing around it. And this is sort of the second time you're kind of releasing with this numeric kind of like, uh, I guess, a uh, 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 theme. And But yep. this time in Web3. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm super stoked on it. I, because it's like I wanted to do so many more songs <laughs> just because like, man, I, I just get ahead of myself a lot. But five felt just correct you know so okay. so that's where we landed on the five um and then there's threes so like okay. there's 333 total editions and oh wow it's three by three by three the reason why is because it's like it's a it's a cube it's like okay <laughs> oh that's part of part of the whole art okay okay cool yeah. so five songs um three by three by three so how does that actually work on a on like a drop mechanic is are they they're all editions obviously but yep. are they back to back to back are they separated across a couple of days because this is the first time i'm seeing a, a one drop bundle a few songs yeah. right i've i've seen artists by the way i've seen artists combine like an ep and mint a one of one on a catalog for example right. but this is the first time i see it in this sort of format help exactly. me help me understand a little bit better so this is why uh sound protocol i'm extremely excited about it it's making it it's it's an easy way for an artist to release a long form project in a pretty easily digestible way so the really what's happening is like um say for this project i have five songs you're not going to know which song that you meant it's going to be like randomized um and there's not the same amount of additions for each song um 
yeah so there's like you know rarity baked into it got it depending okay. on which song that you get for sure um, and 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 what are the songs that are dropping yeah so we have a song called i actually got to pull up the list i have a song called zoom uh with daniel uh cool daniel allen uh i have toxic which i'm super stoked about that's with bloody white i have a song called a convo um with production help from clear eyes and tara lago who sub made the beat and then buck which is like the squad song <laughs> with all cool. these that's like fluco deegan and black honey yeah so, okay cool yeah. so i feel like each song will have its own its own kind of like look and feel it's vibe i'm curious what what is what is your creative process sort of look like especially in in putting together this this project yeah um so the creative process kind of varies uh with me uh because i like to switch things up otherwise like if i i'm writing in the same manner for like too long a lot of the music will start to blend and feel like um feel like i was making it in like a specific you know era i guess um so sometimes i start with um you know making a beat um because i'm a producer as well other times like i'll just like get outside production from some of my friends and um just do the vocals and the melody um and yeah other times i'll completely make a whole song scrap all the production and just send it off to one of the homies for them to like build totally upon <laughs> yeah but uh yeah and then as far as putting the music together um this was all kind of like made during the same time so it all felt like you know like it should all be in a home right. together and so yeah so i was super excited when we were narrowing down the songs and whatnot uh and uh yeah cool okay so you know early in the conversation you sort of talked about how you got into crypto because yeah, COVID kicked in, you could no longer tour, which a lot of your money was com coming from that, your income. And yep. then it just kind of like cold turkey stopped, like out of nowhere. And then yep. you spent all this time in Web3 and now you're cur curating projects that are crypto native, right? And uh, you're building a collector base. And I feel like you're making a good amount. I don't want to say a good amount, like that's up for you to decide, but you're making money online, right? Yep. By doing the things that you love without having to go on a world tour but where yeah. does the tour fit in still right so if you're if you're creating drops specifically for like a, a web3 native audience it's still relatively small i think there's like less than even ten thousand music nft collectors as a whole right right yeah. how do you now how do you now think about what you used to do right which is touring traditional music pr producing publishing etc to what you're doing now like where do the two sort of mix and match yeah no that's a good question um it's interesting right now because I took time off of touring uh, in the last year. So that way I could build uh, on this side of things and then also just like crank out a whole bunch of music. I just wanted to be extremely creative in this last year, which I'm so grateful that I did because like at the end of the day, like I love making music in my bedroom more than anything. <laughs> and, mm. You know, like that's what gives me extreme joy. And uh, coming up with ideas and whatnot and being in kind of my element. Uh, touring sometimes is really difficult on, like, my mind and, like, my body and whatnot, which uh, uh, it's just rough. But it's, like, the truth and it's the fact of the matter. Um, but I love touring, though. Don't get me wrong. I love it. You know? <laughs> and I love being in front of, uh, in front of like, in front of everyone and uh, performing the songs live. Uh, so... When COVID happened, I had just got off of like, I think Harley and I were like on like a seven month run or, or eight month run or something like that. So I was on tour with Flume and um, we had gone all around the world and whatnot. And when I came back, I was just so confused because the world pretty much shut down right. immediately after we got off tour. <laughs> and I was like, and I had other shows lined up and I was like, well, I feel weird. I don't know what to do with my hands. You're like back to school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, dude, what's going on? So thank goodness I found, you know, like Web3 and, and crypto and whatnot because, because um, 
you know, I just, I found something that I became extremely passionate about and that mm-hmm. I loved just like I love music, you know? And so, uh, it was easy to want to learn and just to soak up a whole bunch of knowledge right. and whatnot. Yeah. Where, where do you think crypto fits, uh, in like the touring model and the live performance model? Um, so when you do a show now, you have all these collectors, I, I guarantee you they're global, right? Yep. From all over. Or I, I, I think they're global. Um, and now you're going to be performing for your existing fan base that was there prior to all these collectors. Maybe there's an overlap. Yeah. But now, as you sort of maybe plan your next tour, you have all these collectors, you have these, these original fans. How do you mix and match the experience to cater to those who have NFTs, those who don't have NFTs? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I'm still tr- piecing that together. Uh, the interesting thing is, I remember like the first moment that I uh, spoke publicly about, you know, like, oh yeah, I want to experiment uh, with music NFTs. Man, my traditional fan base was like, "You're killing the environment." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Oh jeez," I didn't realize like, yeah, I mean. Which definitely is not the You're case. like, shit, I didn't know that was the case. Now it's <laughs> yeah. no longer, now they can't say that. We've transitioned exactly. to proof of stake. Yes. Proof of stake now, for sure. Yeah, yes. definitely. <laughs> yeah, man. I, uh, so, yeah, that was very interesting to see, like, all, like, the pushback. Um, so, like I said, I think it's still just, we just still need a little bit more time and, like, education for, um, for certain groups and whatnot. So, We'll see. I don't know how it translates because I do have two completely separate groups of like supporters, you know, right. and, and I'm trying to find a way to bridge the gap. Um, I want to get a music NFT in, in, in everyone's wallet, <laughs> you mm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's like, a, that's definitely a main goal of mine for sure. I wonder how that could work on a live performance basis. And if you have like LED screens, everybody sort of scans a QR code and they all get airdropped an NFT of yours, right? Yeah, Um, I mean, like I know Justin like Blau. um, Yep, exactly. He's done some really cool stuff like that. I know like the, the, the common answer is like, you know, the ticketing system um, or else like the festival um, wristband becomes like, you know, uh an nft that you know concert goers can keep forever you know Mm -hmm. and have it uh be a novelty item after the show is done um yeah i i don't know where it actually fits currently though beyond that because it's like like i said you know one day something's going on and then the next like there's so much quick evolution so it's like oh cool like (laughs) you know uh so I, I'm sure I'm sure it will NFTs will be all over music, you know, like in the next like year, year and a half, right? In in ways that I'm definitely you know like not capable probably of even thinking about right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious. This is going to be drop number what in your in your history? What in what drop number is this? Yeah, uh, it's going to be fifth question. drop, sixth drop. Yeah. I've done a lot of uh, singular drops, right? Okay. So I have a lot of releases across catalog. Um, okay. I have a lot of releases across sound. Um, I was part of Daniel Allen's Glass House drop. That's um, right. Yeah. And so so this is going to be – this is my biggest drop as Rio Cragen uh, by myself like to date for sure. So across all the other – experiences and drops you've had what are some Mm -hmm. things you've learned along the way that you're applying to this drop um that's a good question i think i think we're scaling it uh it's way more in depth um sound protocol um being like a main part of this drop as well sure um and just like continued experimentation uh like i said like the main goal was to like release a long form project in a meaningful way and like a really cool way. And I think we're, you know, we're going to do a great job at delivering that. Um, Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then also what's different is generally in like a sound drop, there's only one golden egg. So in this there's, there's five separate. Got it. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. <laughs> five five golden eggs, uh, kind of like crammed within thirty three, uh, three hundred thirty three right. editions. It's gonna be a editions. it's gonna be a war zone, my guy. It's gonna be a war zone. <laughs> I know, right? That's I crazy. Know, yeah, it's a little... That's yeah. that's wild. So I wanna I wanna jump into uh, Twitter for a second, and yep. uh, I think yesterday we tweeted hosting hosting you tomorrow on Mint. What should we talk about? And uh, this one gentleman that goes by the name of Cooper listed a couple <laughs> things. Okay, um, he wants us to talk about Nipsey's uh, proud to pay culture, how to treat label opportunities, and early hip hop stories. And what I learned behind the scenes is that you actually had a relationship with Nipsey Hustle, um, yep. and he kind of like mentored you to an extent as well right can you talk so, about that yeah so really what it was is nip was one of the first like artists of like that caliber like uh just like larger artists to believe in my music back when i you know barely had any music out and when i was getting no looks um and just like head down grinding you know what i mean uh and yeah, my my manager had introduced me to him and um yeah, he just really schooled me um and told me about, you know, the power of of ownership in the music business and um why he went the independent route and um and how that could be beneficial. Um and uh yeah, and so that's how I met Nip. And it was just crazy, man. Um crazy can you can you talk about also behind the scenes you were telling me how he started selling hip-hop beats right and tapes essentially for a certain so, price yeah so he he was a uh, nip made a whole bunch of mixtapes right so he came up with this concept of proud to pay which is which was pretty much like you know like music nfts and web3 <laughs> like right. before it existed it was like the the ethos of it um where you should look after your core fans and offer exclusive experiences and and whatnot. So he started out with uh, dropping a project at a hundred dollars each, um, which initially uh, was like brand new. You know, it was like a it was insane concept. Uh, and he sold out all of the copies of the mixtape, uh, and then a couple years later went on to release. Uh, mailbox money and i believe he sold that at a thousand dollars uh wow per per unit yeah for sure crazy the mix how 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 has uh your relationship sort of yeah kind of like paved your career as an artist yeah. like what were, what were some of the biggest things you kind of took away from him um and yeah, even either sure. applied it in like music traditionally or even in like dropping music nfts I mean, I went independent because, uh, <laughs> you know, of the early conversations that I was having with Nip and whatnot. Uh, so originally I was signed to Capitol Records. So, mm. um, or I'm sorry, Virgin. It's on, it's in the Capitol building though. Um, and that's where I put out my first album. It did really well. Um, and I put out another project, but I was losing creative control. I could just feel it, you know? Like it was more suggestions of you should make music like this. You should hire this person to do the video. You should, um, you know, start. Here's a stylist for this and that. And it was like, yo, what is it <laughs> like? Yeah, this isn't this isn't me. And um, so I opted to to leave. And so uh, we ended up getting out of it pretty smoothly. Um, and it was it was pretty solid experience of getting out because I've heard some horror stories of like artists sure. trying to get out of deals. Um, and yeah, we, we ended up running an independent and uh, again, just like moving to Los Angeles and I was terrified. That was another defining moment where I was terrified <laughs> as an artist. I was like, geez, can I do it without the label? You know what I mean? And uh, thank goodness. Yeah. Uh, I ended up completely uh doing so much better <laughs> yeah how do you yeah. how do you think artists should be treating label opportunities um today um i'm not against the labels no i'm not like uh contrary to popular belief um the uh i think what needs to happen is i would love to see more artist friendly deals that's okay. that's what i would love um because you know my first deal was not artist friendly i mean i can openly say that my first deal was an 80-20 split. Um, I actually even got – I think I only had 16 points on the royalty. So it was like wow. 80-84-16. Crazy. Um, 
yeah and i didn't own the masters um yeah so pretty much i i don't see anything off of that project even though it went on to do like really good numbers um but that's crazy that's kind of like how new artists like are those are the deals that you know you can get offered um i think that there needs to be a new take on you know partnerships um because that's what they should be it should be partnerships it shouldn't be like here's this loan where you you know like you get pretty much nothing in return um yeah for sure so yeah okay that makes sense so in the in the context of crypto in the context Mm -hmm. of music nfts what role do you think labels play where where do they come in because you can now raise money if you build an audience independently across social media that that is your distribution platform right um you can be scrappy enough as well to kind of even get like your own organic press if you're doing something right right yep um now candidly many people don't do things right and they don't kind of like break through the noise but if you kind of experiment and you're open-minded enough you can actually make noise in crypto um yep I'm curious, like what sort of value do you think they provide now as, as you are kind of like even more becoming a web three native music artist? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that, you know, ears are still everything, you know what I mean? Sure. Like, um, like every artist still wants their music to be heard by a lot of mm-hmm. people and for good reason, you know, like this is how we scale things. This is how you, you acquire new fans, how how people have good experiences and whatnot. And uh, yeah, so I think that, you know, distribution is still very much needed for artists because it's one thing for you to be successful um, in music NFTs, like as far as like volume or whatever, but, you know, you still want that to translate to like um, a greater audience as well, Mm -hmm. because that way everyone's happy, you know, like um, if you have, if your songs do a lot better, um theoretically the you know the music nft should have music more value sure um and vice versa yeah for sure okay that makes sense that makes sense i think labels can play a role in all of this um i just i feel like i feel like new forms of probably um partnerships can be formed throughout all of this now um because you know like you said uh artists are making a little bit more money uh they have a new st- revenue stream um and you know the, a lot of people don't necessarily need the label's funds so maybe there can be like these types of deals where an artist doesn't need an advance and can you know retain a lot more ownership while still having the distribution services of the labels have we seen anybody uh exec- execute that uh the right way yet like any artist comes to mind that's a good question i know um certain deals or certain artists have like really favorable deals like okay for example i mean i'm sure that drake's deal like they're not taking 80 percent sure, of drake's deal, sure. <laughs> i know? guess i guess i'm talking more in the context of like us in crypto for example right right i don't think that exists yet no okay i don't think interesting because so. we're yeah. seeing we're seeing more labels kind of uh start these web three music labels right like the crypto native music labels and yep none of them have really like made serious noise just yet they just got the attention because it shows this this legacy brand is now entering crypto and sort of validates maybe everything that we've been kind of like paying for right so maybe they're going to buy our bags who knows right (laughs) (laughs) right (laughs) um but uh we have yet to see um like a, a big label do it right publicly yeah and maybe it's intentional maybe maybe it's just like part of their r d fund maybe they're just experimenting experimenting uh experimentating wow just as much as we are you know who knows um do you have any insight on that as to how labels feel about these nfts how they feel about crypto native uh music artists What, what what are your thoughts any insights yeah i mean i know everyone's excited about it um i think that really i think that they're trying to figure out like uh correct and solid entry points you know what i mean because i think like a lot of the consensus um in like the music nft like ecosystem is kind of just like no one's really fucking with the labels type stuff you know it's like there's so many horror stories you know like like me having 16 points on the royalties you know like i know that a whole bunch of other 
artists in the space have had disgusting, you know, relationships with sure with uh with the label system and whatnot, and it's it's just unfortunate. But so I think that I think that you know probably they're just like trying to figure out a solid entry point because they have to they have to start being the good guy, right? <laughs> More favorable artist deals, honestly, is like how how that um I I think how everything comes full circle. Yeah. Just like probably a new take on like what it means to be in the music business. Mm. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. I think uh Rio, you bring a really you bring a really cool perspective into the space because you're not just an artist. You dropped out of college. You're like you're very much an entrepreneur yourself, right? In in many respects. Um, whether it, it extends on the music front, right? Whether it extends to you couch surfing and just continuously doubling down on yourself or even starting a project in Web3. Or I don't know if it's like necessarily a Web3 native project, but this like creative incubator that you have called Loner's DAO, right? Yep. So I guess it is I guess it is a Web3 if it has the DAO at the end. <laughs> um, talk, me, talk me more through that because I remember when the Mirror campaign came out and you were doing a crowdfund uh, for Loner's DAO. Um, what's the status of loner style like what have you been doing with that um because i know you're also in the in the music nft incubator the cooper started right so is there yep. collaboration i have so many questions i'll let you <laughs> i'll let you kick it off yeah yeah uh no there's no collaboration right now uh okay. the um uh, a, a lot of my focus has been geared towards especially in the last like six months has been geared towards onboarding more talent into the space and um just like educating people on, you know, the music NFT side of things. Um, I I think, um, you know, as the space continues to grow, the space will just continue to get better. Um, there will be more creative drops. There will be, you know, like a lot of music, um, probably really good music that enters the space and whatnot. Um, and it's just going to push things forward. And so, uh that's been my whole you know thought process for like quite some time now uh, and yeah i'm on i'm on the board of cooper's uh launch pad which uh, i'm super stoked about i think there's so much talent in this first uh group of artists it's just so insane uh we just had a spaces the other day where everyone yeah. was talking about their experience and i was just like dang man like this is this is really cool i feel like i'm part of something like great and loner's dow you know is a creative incubator um also like we onboarded uh a f- i think like half of the talent uh on loner's dow to mm. web3 which was really cool and then a couple of the artists um were already in this space got it and really what we've been doing is we've been working on uh a long form project and then we've also okay. been working on a generative project for loner's got dow. it so that's when what can we up to. <laughs> got it when, when can we expect to see some uh public stuff from yeah Dow, like actually, these projects that you're working on yeah pretty soon within the next couple of months for sure okay maybe we'll have to run another episode around that time yeah we'll have to run it back um, for sure <laughs> yeah talk to me more through the uh the music nft launchpad um you're on mm-hmm. the curation board um i from what i understood from cooper when he was on i think a couple a few episodes back um every single person on the board had sort of one pick to bet on right and, and yep. an artist to bring up on board um what did the curriculum sort of look like and what sort of value did these artists get once they joined the launchpad yeah it was um a a lot of the curriculum was um it was it was broad right because it was great curriculum by the way cooper crushed it cooper kind of like did all of this and spearheaded it um he's just an animal honestly yeah so so it was it was kind of broad because you know like it's I, I think the concept was how do you um educate someone so like it was like okay here's how you download the metamask was like the early classes let's get everyone's ens domains um and then like uh how to be in like the discords and telegrams and like on twitter um how to go about creating uh and drafting up ideas for a music nft launch mm-hmm. um other creators in the space it was like it was really cool (laughs) so it started out it started out broad and then it got a little bit more um um focused and whatnot um which was really cool yeah and then everyone's like been drafting up like their initial thoughts on like what they're planning on doing for their first drop and whatnot which has been okay 
So now when these artists drop, are you guys playing like a, a major role in sort of finding them the right PR, finding them the right kind of like letting other collectors know like what, what happens post launch pad when they are ready to drop? What sort of, uh, I guess, like coaching or consulting or whatever they get, do they get from you guys? Yeah. So a lot of it, they're one on one with Coop uh, mm. for sure. Um, and then, you know, like I've talked directly to probably like four of the artists in the, uh, in the launch pad. Uh, well, I've talked directly to a lot of them, but on a consistent basis, I've probably talked to four of the artists. And so, yeah, I mean, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm a music collector myself. I have close to like a hundred music NFTs from other creators in mm -hmm. the space and just like friends and stuff like that. So yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be pressing the mint button for sure <laughs> okay. on, on a lot of these artists. And then, yeah, of course, introducing uh, them to other collectors in the space and uh, just putting them on people's radar because there's a cool. lot of talent in this, in this, uh, in this group. It's just mind blowing. Cool. Yeah. So you've collected about a hundred music NFTs yourself. What do you yep. look for as a collector when you sort of, uh, yeah, spend your ETH on an artist? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Um, I just, I like, I like people who are like hardworking in the space and who are pretty vocal. Um, I also like good music as well. So like, I'm looking kind of like for all that criteria and, um, people, you know, who are showing up for sure, for sure. That's like, uh, that's my main, <laughs> that's my, main how thing. do you, how do you advise people to consistently show up? That's something that I also advise uh, artists and creators that want to come into crypto. You just mm -hmm. consistently show up. But how do you define consistently showing up? Like, what does that look like on an action based level? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think really being active on Twitter, being active on certain telegrams, um, you know, joining certain DAOs um, to, you know, be part of community calls and get more education. Um, things of that nature and then constantly releasing music nfts as well not like taking three months off before you're doing your next drop and whatnot uh yeah for sure and then you know especially people who are like boundary pushing uh trying to do things outside of what their peers are doing um is always a really cool thing um for sure yeah that makes sense i guess uh i guess before we we uh we wrap up rio any anything you think that I'm missing? Because um, I, I find your background really cool. I find you obviously have a lot of experience. You've toured also, from what I understood, with Billie Eilish, Flume, yeah. Lil, Lil Yachty, like all these really big heads. Um, and you're obviously making now a name for yourself in crypto too. Um, what am I? What am I missing here? What do you think? Uh, man, I mean, nothing really. I I do just want to say that I'm just like really excited for the future, and I think that you know, we're just really on the surface of this. I think that it turns into an animal <laughs> and just like gets legs. And um, I think that it's really going to impact music as a whole. And the way that people think about, you know, releasing music, for sure. I know that my personal releases have gotten extremely creative since like, you know, I started making music in a seas. Um, yeah. And it's become way more artistic you know i feel like the music has you know i've always worked extremely hard on the music and i always want it to be like top notch um but it's really cool that i don't just make cover art anymore you know what i mean like yeah it's like you spend all this time on the music all this time you know sometimes a year on the music and then on the artistic side like you spend like a week on it and then it's uh -huh. over. You know what I mean? It's like, now it's like, okay, cool. Like I can also spend, you know, some blood, sweat and tears and, and, and a little love on, on the digital side of the art and whatnot, which is really cool because I feel like, you know, you can make the music into an experience now. Sure. Um, yeah. And you know, some people are even using it as, you know, like content for their live shows. It's right. A, yeah which right. is pretty sick. Yeah. Do you, do you ever imagine playing a concert just for your collectors, like a room of like 300 people? Right. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. I think that would be really cool. I think it would be amazing. Honestly, like, 
you got to think too like um this stuff has existed before just in a different medium you know it's like j cole playing shows for his fans only for a dollar because he got a dollar in a dream you know i think right. like that's like a really similar thing and it's like yeah i would love to do that you know what i mean throw a free show for the collectors um okay that'd be so sick <laughs> all right so i'm gonna keep collecting then um let's go <laughs> yo before before i let you go um you know, where can we find you where can we stay in touch show it away yeah of course you can find me on twitter instagram anywhere my handle is okay. the same it's at rio cragen r-e-o-c-r-a-g-u-n um and on sound xyz and catalog i guess <laughs> amazing so yeah. tuesday this is when this episode is going to come out as well on tuesday that's when the drop is i'm excited to be listening to the drop and the five tracks that you have called framework uh, with all these different artists collabs and honestly your biggest project to date so best of luck i'm stoked for you and uh yeah we'll have to do this again soon thanks man yeah let's definitely let's tap in <laughs>